Hi everyone, it's, it's really nice to be here or um, not to be here and um, thank you so much Stephanie for, for organising this, this is really really wonderful and um, I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Um, this is a talk called The Mesh, it's based on an idea from one of the main, two main ideas of, of, of my new book, uh, The Ecological Thought, which is the prequel to Ecology Without Nature. I think that for some various different reasons, maybe just because I don't have enough RAM in my brain, um, I couldn't think the ecological thought until I'd written Ecology Without Nature, but I think maybe, possibly, um, possibly not. Um, there's, uh, there's a rigorous reason why the ecological thought is a sort of emergent um, politics and philosophy at the moment, and so in some ways it's it's not yet fully thinkable. So I think it does have to follow follow the first project. Anyway, this is the mesh, and um, it starts with this question: What is interdependence? Let's imagine a, a theorem called the interdependence theorem. The interdependence theorem contains two simple axioms. Axiom one states that for every a the existence of A is such that A consists of things that are not not A. In other words, A is made of not A such that the only way to define it is negatively and differentially. Thus, A is A because it isn't not A, while not A is only not A because it is not A. So A and not A are mutually determining. Axiom 1 states that things are only what they are in relation to other things. Axiom 2 states that things derive from other things. While axiom 1 is concerned with how things are, synchronically, axiom 2 talks about origins, diachrony. In every case, things like A only exist such that a not A exists. Nothing exists by itself, and nothing comes from nothing. Axioms 1 and 2 define in interdependence across a range of phenomena. They summarize structural linguistics, for instance, because structuralism's model of language is that signs are completely interdependent. The interdependence theorem also describes life forms. Diachronically, no life form exists that didn't arise from another life form, and synchronically, life forms are different from each other in arbitrarily negative ways. There's no human flavored DNA as opposed to daffodil flavored DNA, for instance. Um, we all know that, uh, or we should know now, that um, humans are 98% chimp. Human DNA is 98% chimp, um, but also 35% daffodil. Wordsworth, eat your heart out. So, in, since life forms are expressions of, of DNA, they in fact differ from each other negatively rather than positively, since DNA is, of course, a language and thus can be modelled by structuralism. Since life forms depend upon each other the same way signs depend upon each other, the system of life forms is isometric with the system of language. This means that since language as a system is subject to deconstruction, the system of life forms must also be subject to deconstruction. What happens when we subject the system of life forms to deconstruction? Let's remind ourselves what happens when we subject the system of language to deconstruction. Derrida describes this as thinking the structurality of structure. What kind of structure? It's open-ended. It has no center and no edge. Because language is an arbitrary system of negative difference, there's no sign that stands somehow outside the system to guarantee the meaning and stability of the other signs. This means language is infinite, in the strong sense that we can never fully account for its meanings or effects. It also means that meaning depends upon meaninglessness, and that language as a system isn't a thing, not an object, but a strange infinite network that has neither inside nor outside. The process that makes signs manifest as appearance and meaning is différence, the process of difference, synchronic, and deferment, diachronic. The meaning of a word is another word, and strings of signs only gain significance retroactively. The meaning of a sentence is a moving target. You'll never be able to know exactly where the end of this sentence is until after you've heard it. Elephant. This means that coherence, in order to be coherence, must contain some incoherence. We can apply exactly the same view to the system of life forms. Life forms are made up of other life forms, the theory of symbiosis, and life forms derive from other life forms, evolution. It's so simple and yet so profound. Because of the ecological emergency we have entered, we are now compelled to take account of this mind-changing view. The implications of a deconstructive view of life forms are manifold. 1. Life forms constitute a mesh that is infinite 
and beyond concept, unthinkable as such. Two, tracing the origins of life to a moment prior to life will result in paradoxes. Three, drawing distinctions between life and non-life is strictly impossible yet unavoidable. Four, differentiating one species and another is never absolute. Five, there's no outside of the system of life forms. Six, the interdependence theorem is part of the system of interdependence and thus subject to deconstruction. And seven, since we cannot know in advance what the effects of the system will be, all life forms are theorizable as strange strangers. So let's sift through these implications. One, life forms constitute a mesh that is infinite and beyond concept, unthinkable as such. This isn't just because the mesh is too large, but also because it is also infinitesimally small. Differentiation goes down to the genomic level. There is no human-flavoured DNA, no daffodil-flavoured DNA. Most of the words that I thought of to describe this were compromised by references to the internet, network, for example. Either that or they were compromised by vitalism, the belief in a living substance. Web is a little bit too vitalist and a little bit internetish too, so I guess it loses on both counts. Mesh can mean both the holes in a network and the threading between them. It suggests both hardness and delicacy. It has uses in biology, mathematics and engineering, and in weaving and computing. Think stockings and graphic design, metals and fabrics. It has antecedents in mask and in mass, suggesting both density and deception. By extension, mesh can mean, and I'm quoting the OED here, a complex situation or series of events in which a person is entangled, a concatenation of constraining or restricting forces or circumstances, a snare. In other words, it's perfect. If everything is interconnected, then there's no definite background and therefore no definite foreground. Charles Darwin sensed this via thinking through the implications of the theory of natural selection. You can feel his palpable amazement in the quotation there, which um, I'm not going to read. Every single life form is literally familiar in that we are genetically descended from them. Darwin imagines an endlessly branching tree. Mesh doesn't suggest a clear starting point, and those clusters of subordinate groups in the quotation above are far from linear. They cannot be ranked in a single file. Each point of the mesh is both the centre and edge of a system of points, so there is no absolute centre or edge. Still, the tree, the tree image marvellously closes out Darwin's chapter on natural selection with its evocation of the great tree of life which fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers the surface with its ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. A ramification is a branch and an implication, a, a, a branching thought, so it's, it's thinking and living at the same time.